Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels and the glory of the Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Beloved, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the one who calls us into community. Amen. So, once upon a time, television shows were watched at the exact time they aired. (laughs) On one of three networks. I know. There were no streaming services out there. If you missed a show for any reason, you'd have to wait and watch it on reruns. You couldn't even record it and watch it later. You definitely couldn't just pick up your computer and tune in at any time it was convenient for you. And when the end of the season rolled around in late spring and your favorite shows took a break for the summer, there would sometimes be a cliffhanger or a storyline that would need to be continued when they picked back up in the fall. Anybody else spend a whole summer wondering, who shot JR? (laughs) Today's gospel reading is a little bit like the next episode in Matthew's gospel. If the theme of last week's gospel was, or you remember when you get the TV guide and they would have the little synopsis of each show? I'm just totally, I had a birthday yesterday, so I'm totally showing you how old I am. But if last week's theme was Jesus' question to the disciples, who do you say that I am? Then the theme of this week's gospel episode is the very good Lutheran question, What does this mean? (laughs) Last week, Peter answered Jesus' question of who do you say that I am with an accurate answer. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And in today's reading, Jesus offers an interpretive movement. He tells Peter and the other disciples exactly what it means that he is the Messiah. He says he must suffer at the hands of the chief priests and the authorities, and eventually he will be killed and rise again in three days. And Peter does not take well to this news. He's distressed. He doesn't want Jesus to be talking in this manner. And so he has the nerve to rebuke Jesus. God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you that doesn't turn out so well for Peter because last week Jesus said, you're the rock on who I will build my church. And this week he says, get behind me, Satan. It is always hard on communities, on nations, on entire societies when leaders don't turn out to be who we expected them to be, when they don't fit into our little boxes. No one wants to accept that. 
They try to explain it away or say that it never happened that way. So who can blame Peter? He's finally declared who Jesus is. He finally gets it. You are the Messiah. It's safe to assume that when the Messiah arrived, nobody thought that he would be anything less than a strong and mighty ruler. That he would rule without opposition, that nobody would dare stand up to him, much less the chief priests and elders. Who could have imagined being the Messiah would mean he would suffer and die? And Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, you know, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourselves and take up your cross. Actually, he says, deny yourselves and take up your crosses and follow me. So I really want to spend some time this morning considering together what this means. What does it mean to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses? It is significant that Jesus speaks in plural form. He isn't picking out people and saying, you must deny yourself and you must take up your cross. Jesus says, y'all, as a community, together, deny yourselves and take up your crosses. This isn't so we will receive salvation. Jesus will take care of that through his life, through his death, and through his rising again. To follow Jesus in this denying ourselves and take up our crosses way is not for our sake. It is for the sake of the world. It is to live in such a way that invites and invokes peace and justice and unity. To take up our cross is the stuff of daily decision making. How will we live this day? It is a daily dying to self and rising to Christ. It is daily choosing to live in a way that brings divine justice and peace and the unity of God to all people, not just to ourselves, not just to the Lutherans and maybe the Episcopalians can join us. You know, it's to all people. Jesus goes on to speak of losing our lives in order to save them. And the word that Jesus uses here is not like our bodies. It's not those lives. It's our losing our inner lives, losing our spiritual selves. Jesus is not talking about, nor is he requiring us to be martyrs. He is requiring us to live in such a way that our physical actions reflect our spiritual selves. That who we are in the world shows what we believe. Paul writes today about how to live in community together with one another in our Romans reading. And he, he offers this whole list of imperatives that really could work for any group of people living together in community, Christian, non-Christian, anybody. You might find these sorts of instructions in a civic organization or a scout troop. They're just universally good behaviors. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And he goes on, ending finally with how we are to treat our enemies. But how do those instructions to the believers in Rome translate to a cross-shaped life for us? How might you know that the community in Rome or the community that followed Jesus or the community at Agnus Day weren't just fine, upstanding citizens. That is when it helps to connect Jesus' reminders in the gospel today to Paul's instructions to the believers at Rome. For those who follow Jesus, we live in the ways that Paul described, not because it's just a good idea, 
not because it will keep us out of jail or feeling good about ourselves, but for the sake of the other person. For the sake of those who are sitting next to you here this morning, for the sake of those not here today, for the person who pulled out in front of you in the roundabout, <laughs> and for the person, Paul adds, who is your enemy. This is important for us, for us all in every season. And it will be especially useful to you all, dear people of Agnuste, as you begin the work of identifying what you hope for in your next pastor and calling them. You may disagree with one another about what you hope for and what you're looking for. Despite the fine work of the transition team, you might all have your own separate ideas. That's okay. Love one another with mutual affection, Paul writes. Outdo one another in showing honor. In this transition season, you may have to do some of the work that is normally managed by your pastor. That's okay. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit, Paul writes. Serve the Lord. There may be times when the process is taking much longer than you wanted it to, or you think it's moving too quickly for your taste, and that's okay. Rejoice in hope, Paul writes. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Persevere in prayer. I will be praying for you. I have been praying for you. Continue to be the beloved community that God has called you to be in this place. The ministry still needs you. The mission still exists. Contribute to the needs of the saints, Paul writes. Extend hospitality to strangers. And he goes on. And there are words worth hearing again. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, live peaceably with all. The entire corpus of Paul's work, as we find it, consists of letters to a whole variety of communities of believers. And he writes to them in a whole variety of circumstances and for a whole variety of reasons. In some cases, he is exasperated with them and he calls out the ways that they fail to live for the sake of each other. He even resorts to name calling from time to time. Just check out the beginning of Galatians. Paul in this pastor's opinion, was a very complicated person, and it's equally complicated to take in all that he has to say. All that he has to say to those earliest believers and all that he has to say to us. But as I conclude this sermon and as I conclude my time with you all as your bridge pastor, I want to borrow a phrase from another one of Paul's letters and offer it as my word to you, God's beloved community, God's precious people at Agnus Day. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with you in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear ones, and thanks be to God. And let the church say, Amen. Amen.